just to make sure that um, I'm getting through loud and clear. Thank you much and welcome to our webinar. We will be speaking today about advanced topics. And before we start, there are a few things that I wanted to go through. So today is the third Friday of the month. And that's when we speak about advanced topics. People who are just starting with the platform and would like to learn the basics are welcome to join us uh, during the first Friday of the month. That's when we speak about getting started. Every participant will receive this presentation as a PDF and as well as the video or recording of today's webinar. So no need to take notes. If you have questions at any point during this presentation, please ask your questions using either Q&A or chat option of Zoom. We will come back and uh, answer the questions at the dedicated time slots. Here, we will assume that uh, the webinar attendees are experienced computational material scientists, familiar with tools like Quantum Espresso, VASP, or similar. We will assume that um, the webinar attendees understand the basics of Linux and Unix um, operating system. And they have an established set of scripts, input files that they use to perform calculations. So our focus today will be on how we can migrate the scripts and input files to the exabyte.tail platform and how we can enable enhanced collaboration after we migrate. All right. Basically, we will be speaking about one of the two options uh, listed here. There is an option to bypass the web interface and use alternative connection methods to be able to access the command line environment within the Exabyte platform and use the file system to collaborate with it. And then the second option is to use the Exabyte platform approach and create the materials, workflows, and uh, jobs entities within the platform. And then use our permission-based um, service levels and account scheme to do the collaboration. And I will cover both of the scenarios today. And uh, Essentially, for the collaboration, we have um, to use one of these two scenarios as well. Either we share access to the data in the file system through command line, or we share access to the Exabyte platform, and we uh, put permission-based scheme to access the entities. So today, we will speak first about the platform infrastructure, and then we will speak about uh, each of the entities that we can work with and migrate um, into the platform, like materials, simulation workflows, calculation jobs. And we will finish with uh, an in-depth review of um, collaboration, how we can, after we create those entities, how we can collaborate on sharing access to those entities with um, other people in the platform or with people outside the platform as well. Okay. A uh, quick note about the webinar account for the users present here today. Uh, you can request to be added to the webinar account uh, team account in the Exabyte platform. And uh, this account has advanced features enabled for it. So you can try those advanced features if they are not presently enabled for your account. Okay, so let's proceed and speak about the platform infrastructure. Here you can you can see the um, diagram that demonstrates the different parts of the Exabyte platform. And if we zoom in at the front of this diagram, at the top part, we'll see that there are multiple ways to connect into the all um, this infrastructure. The natural way is to use the web browser and connect to the web interface. But there are alternative ways as well, and we will speak about three of them today. So number one, we can use a secure shell connection excuse me, and connect directly to the login node. Or we could use the web interface as a proxy and connect either to um, the web terminal or a remote desktop to the login node again. So the login node really represents the connection points for this remote connection methods. There is also a fourth option to use a RESTful API, but we will not cover it um, during today's conversation. So we'll focus on the secure shell connection, um, the web-based um, command line connection, and on the remote desktop today. 
So in order to establish the SSH connection, we have to establish the key um, authentication with the platform. And to do that, we can navigate to the preferences tab of our account and upload a public key. After we do that, and we see this um, light turn green, we can use this public and private key pair to connect to the XFI platform. The web terminal can be accessed from the web. So we can open the right-hand sidebar, select terminal inside the sidebar. And here we're gonna be connected into the platform right inside the web terminal. And equivalently, we can use the, uh, the web terminal, the web-based connection to connect to the remote desktop session and access the full featured operating system environment, uh, graphical environment for a Linux system that we have installed on the login node. Okay, this is usually handy to access the data that is uh, produced by the calculations and not yet prepared, not yet processed by the web application needs. All right. Now, in order to collaborate and understand uh, how we can share the data in the infrastructure that we uh, provide to the users. It's important to understand how the file system works. And here is the picture that demonstrates our approach. So once we connect to the login node, we can access the file systems of multiple aggregated computational clusters. And for each of these clusters, the idea is that it can reside on a separate cloud provider in a separate location for this cloud provider so that we can aggregate the data and make it convenient for the users to see all this data in one place. So a home folder of cluster 001, for example, is mounted to the network file system to the login node and is made available for the user uh, under their equivalent home folder on that login node. So if you go and look at this home folder, we'll see a link to cluster 001 and 007. Those two are present in production today. And if you navigate down into one of the subfolders uh, marked by this symbolic links, we will see the content of uh, each of the cluster home directories. And here we have, again, some system level directories that we create, pre-create for each account, such as um, uh, there's uh, links to organizational accounts. For example, I am a member of Exabyte IO account, so I can see the link uh, to be able to access its data. There is a data folder where the jobs that originate on the web are organized. And there are also two other folders, um, a Dropbox folder and a templates folder for the command line jobs. The Dropbox folder is a very similar in concept to um, the Dropbox application, familiar to many. Uh, it's similar to uh, it because it makes the data available everywhere in the platform. Data is available both on the web interface and on the login node and on the computational cluster. So when we share things like uh, city potentials or input files or some small calculation artifacts, this is a handy way to do that by putting them, uh, this artifacts into Dropbox folder. The data folder has a certain naming convention that is used to mark each of the calculations that originate on the web. So for example, if um, a user with the username Steven and uh, a project name default has created a job with uh, this uh, name that is marked by the job date. And once the job is created, it is assigned an ID inside the database. Then according to all this information, we will concatenate all these items, make them computer safe. So we'll remove spaces and replace them with dashes and things like that. And this is going to constitute the name of the job inside this data folder. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between each job that originates on the web and its representation, its data that resides in the command line. This way we can clearly uh, 
we can debug the calculations, so we can find uh, the data that they produce easily in the command line system as well. So when these calculations produce data, it is convenient sometimes to use additional set of uh, visualization tools that we can access through remote desktop to visualize this data. And we support um, uh, a few of them, like XCRISTON, here's an example. So if you want to visualize a Fermi uh, surface, then we can navigate directly and find the corresponding file produced inside the calculation. And uh, through this remote desktop session, we can visualize the, the Fermi surface this way. Okay, let me summarize uh, right now uh, about this, this first session. This is the first section of this presentation. Remote connection, it's an alternative way to access the Exabyte platform. And we can enable those upon requests uh, or upon a grade of the service level, those are uh, provided automatically. There are three options, the web terminal, the remote desktop, and a secure shell session. Remote sessions are connected to the login node uh, with a separate home folder for each user. And home folder has links to directories for compute clusters. One important note is that we must submit command line jobs from within a cluster directory. So uh, we have to first navigate into one of the cluster home directories before we can submit a command line job. And that is made for a reason because we need to understand which cluster to send this calculation into. And we can only guess that based on where the data is located. There is a variety of software packages available for both remote desktop and command line modules. And that will now go to the question session. Do we have any? It doesn't look like yet. Maybe too early, so let's continue and speak about how we can input the materials information into the platform. So let's assume that we are starting with um, a set of input scripts. In this case, we have two input files. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this input files code a workflow for quantum espresso. In this case, I have uh, a self consistent field calculation and a non-self-consistent field calculation. The two files, as uh, you can see here, are inspected. First, let's speak about how we can migrate the information about the materials, the structural information, to the platform. To do that, we have two options. Option number one is to create a new material based on the data that is contained inside these files. And to do that, we first prepare the input files. We um, mark the necessary parts. For example, we need to understand what is the type of thick crystal lattice for this material. And we need to understand uh, what are the parameters of the crystal lattice and how are the atomic coordinates coded in uh, for the crystal base. Once we understand that, what we can do is we can navigate to the Exabyte platform and go to materials list, click plus button to open the materials designer session. And within this materials designer session, <clears throat> we now will see that it is being initialized, initialized with a default material, silicon FCC. Now, in order to prepare this session, we don't always want to work with this material. Of course, we can clone it. You know, you can see that there are two materials. We can delete their original one from this session. It doesn't mean that it will delete it from the database. It will just remove it from the current session of the materials designer because we don't need to work with that material. And we will rename our template material according to the, uh, the stoichiometry of the structure that we want to work with right now. So this is a preset um, preparation for inputting the structural information, step number one in the succession. The second step is to work with the crystal lattice, the crystal lattice form here, and migrate the crystallographic information from the input file to materials design. So here, what I'm doing is I first set up the crystal lattice to try clinic according to <clears throat> the original input file. 
And then I see that um, the lattice type here is um, the trigonal. I believe the A and B constants are equivalent and then the C constant is uh, a little larger. So what I can do here, I first need to convert uh, quantum espresso modules units from Bohr's to angstroms, which I can do with Google easily. And so I set up the lattice parameters for A and B lattice constant. And equivalently, I do that for constant C. And then I set up all the angles at 90. After all the parameters are set, I click apply edits. And as you can see, the lattice type had changed the code. We still have the silicon atoms inside the bases. So this will be our next step, but we now have migrated the lattice information for this material. We can visualize it in the 3D uh, panel here. And as you can guess, the next step would be to work with the crystal bases, uh, the second panel here. And fortunately, we already have this crystal basis coordinates to be in the crystal coordinates. So all we need to do here is just to copy and paste the coordinates into the form. Okay. So as you can see here, now we have all the structural information migrated in two relatively simple steps. Step number four in this progression is to save the material. And to do that, I need to navigate um, and open the input output menu and select save from the menu. Then I can also edit um, the metadata that is associated with this uh, soon to be saved entry. And here I am using from PWSCF as a tag to be able to find this material easier in the future. I click the OK button. I uh, make sure that this loader here in the top right corner finishes spinning. And when, when that happens, and uh, I can come back to the list of materials, then I can see this material structure that was just created. And I can see it's tagged accordingly. All right. So that is how we create a new material from uh, structural information coming from quantum espresso. The second option would be to convert the input for quantum espresso to another format first that we directly support for um, uploading. Today we have support for POSCAR and CIF um, structural formats. So what we can do is we can navigate online or use um, OpenLabel a converter to convert the quantum espresso input file and its materials information inside this file to POSCAR, for example. And after we do that, we can utilize the upload option in the materials list to upload the POSCAR file and the materials information uh, stored there. Yeah. We have covered that uh, two weeks ago during the Getting Started webinar, so I will not speak about it today. But that represents the second option uh, for ingesting, migrating the materials information. Now, as you have noticed, this workflow contains two units, uh, the SCF part and the NSCF part left and right. And in order to migrate the logic included in this workflow, we can apply a very similar approach. So just like um, with materials, we can apply um, an approach when we create a workflow inside the platform and we migrate the corresponding syntax from this input files to um, the workflow. So to do that, we need to open the workflow designer and um, demonstrate how this can be done. So we navigate to the list of workflows and just like in the case of materials, we click on the plus button and that opens the workflow designer session. When it happens, uh, the workflow designer session is initialized with an empty workflow, which contains nothing but the, uh, the uh, workflow name and an empty sub workflow. So what we can do next, uh, we can make sure that we put the human readable understandable names for both the workflow and the sub workflow. All right. 
And then after we added the names, in this case, I put the SCF and SCF uh, to represent the logic stored inside the support flow. And after we edit the names, we can uh, add the unit into this first support flow. To do that, we navigate uh, down below to the units panel and click on the plus button here. So what happens after we click apply is that a new unit is added to uh, this support flow. So that's where our support flow now contains logical information, meaningful information for the calculation. So initially the uh, workflow and support flow are empty. And when we add a unit, that's when it starts to be uh, like a, a real production ready calculation. But it contains a template which might not be uh, containing the right information according to the data that we had originally in the input files. So what we should do next is we should navigate and edit the content of this unit. As you can see, uh, we set executable to bpw.x, but we can change that. We can use other executables accordingly for quantum espresso. And there is a set of flavors that we can set uh, to work with the uh, with these flavors as input templates. Fortunately, I am starting from the self-consistent field calculation, so I don't have to change that field right now. But when I navigate down uh, below to the template, I see that the keys that I have here, the properties that are inside the control namespace, a system namespace, and electrons namespace may not be the same as those that I have in the input files. So I need to migrate uh, the properties. And to do that, I copy paste the content of the original input file format it and do that for each of the namespaces. So for example, this meaning uh, was different inside the original input file. So I copy it to the system's uh, namespace. And accordingly, I go through the electrons namespace and copy its content and replace, uh, remove the original one. Now you can notice that we do not copy the original materials information. We keep the uh, syntax, which corresponds to uh, these template variables uh, that are inside uh, this template. Why do we do that? We do that to be able to reuse this workflow with multiple materials. So quantum espresso input files, they're written with materials information and workflow information combined together. And that makes it inflexible because we always have to uh, open the input files and remove the materials information, replace it with a new material when we move from one structure to another. So in this case, by leaving the template variables inside uh, this template, I'm able to preview it uh, with the materials information that we pass as a template variable. So this way we can reuse the uh, logic inside the workflow, uh, the workflow input unit as we put it in here, for multiple materials. So that's what makes it more modular. And as you can see, once we go from template to preview, we now can see the information, structural information for the default material. The workflow designer session uses the default material, which in my case is silicon ATC again, to visualize the templates. So, since I had two units in the original workflow, I need to now repeat this same procedure for the second unit. First, I had to add it, and then I have to go and modify its content. So since it was an NSCF unit, I'm selecting PW NSCF as a flavor, and I am adjusting the um, names, namespace keywords according to the um, original input just like I did for the first unit. Equivalently, I'm copying the corresponding information, going through each of the namespaces and adjusting uh, them accordingly. All right. So at the end, I have a workflow with one sub workflow and two units. And these two units represent exactly the same logic that I started with uh, when I have the input files for quantum express. 
So step number four in this progression, or step six, yeah, since we've started counting earlier, is to save this workflow. And to do that, uh, add just the name, also edit uh, metadata, I add tags to be able to find this workflow easier in the future. And click on the save button in the header. And when the save process is complete, I can see that uh, there is a workflow at the top of my workflows list that represents the logic that I just had inside the content specimen info files. All right, so I can navigate back and inspect this workflow, uh, make sure that it is properly rendered. I can also change the default material, for example, and make sure that the workflow is properly rendered with the material of my choice. So that's how we migrate the workflow information from quantum espresso into files to the platform. The option number two would be to start not with the uh, blank workflow that contains nothing but uh, the, the placeholders. Since there are multiple users already on the platform, close to 1500 as of today, yeah, they constantly produce uh, uh, data and including the workflows data. We can try and reuse some of the uh, workflows that we uh, arranged inside the workflows bank. Workflows bank is the collection of unique workflows that uh, people have generated in our platform. So instead of starting with the uh, empty workflow, we can navigate to the workflows bank list and try to find the one that we are interested in. So for example, here I'm searching for pen structure, selecting, excuse me, selecting the corresponding entity in the, um, the list of workflows and copying it to my account. So when that is done, I have a workflow that already contains the pen structure calculation logic for quantum espresso. And instead of uh, starting from scratch, I can edit the logic that is contained inside this workflow or simply just reuse it. Because in most cases, we probably don't need to change too much. But if I want to, I can adjust the logic accordingly. All right, so with these two options, we can migrate from using uh, Quantum Espresso scripts to using the, uh, the entities inside the Exabyte platform. I have a quick break for questions. Let's see if you have any. Uh, I don't see anything in Q&A, nothing in chat yet. Okay. So let's continue on then and speak about uh, how we can use this materials and workflow information to run the calculations. The first option again would be to bypass the user interface and submit the calculations using the command line. And that's something that we have covered in one of the prior webinars. So I will not be speaking about it today, but that is an option. Today, let's focus on how we can use this freshly migrated, freshly created entities, material and workflow. And so let's set up a calculation using those entities. To do that, um, we need to navigate to the job designer. <clears throat> so uh, a bit of a difference here, we cannot start the job designer from the list of jobs we have to first navigate to the project. We organize jobs into the projects and we do that on purpose because in most cases, uh, the work that computational scientists do is project-based. Uh, project based. So we, uh, we have a certain goal in mind and uh, we organize a set of calculations for this goal together inside the project. So when we navigate into the default project, we can now click on the plus button and create the job. This opens the job designer, which contains three basic steps uh, where we first set the material information. We can also adjust the name of the job, of course, in the header. So if we uh, select, uh, click on these three dots in the top on the drop down and select uh, the select materials option, we can now select the material to be used for this calculation. And I'm going to select the material that I've just uploaded. I've just created earlier in the session, and I will select the workflow that we just created. 
Okay. So steps one and two now are complete. Sometimes, as we can see, the workflow information might um, be different because we have certain default conventions that we apply for uh, for the workflow information, right? For the workflow uh, settings. So here, I would like to make sure that I'm actually using the set of potentials that I would like to be using, which in this case are the default set. And when I navigate uh, to see, to preview the um, input file, I can see that the K point sampling here is actually different from the one that uh, was in my original input file. So here in the original input file, we have four by four by two. And by default, we have sampling based on the key points per reciprocal atom value of 2000 in the platform. And that amounts to five by five by five key point grid in this input as well. So what we can do to change this to make the two key point grids to be equivalent for this calculation, we can navigate to the important settings panel in the workflow. And we can adjust the sampling inside the form. This is what I'm going to do. So instead of five by five by five, I'm using a four by four by two and um, eight by eight by six for the NSCF calculation. And this would change the corresponding parameters in the input file as well. <clears throat> All right, so after editing the workflow, after adjusting the parameters for it, step number five uh, is to set up the compute parameters. And to do that, we go to the compute form and we select the compute parameters in the form. Usually a good rule of thumb is to, uh, for people who are not familiar with this uh, logic that we employ here, not familiar with how we uh, set up the computational infrastructure, a good rule of thumb is to use the regular, ordinary regular Q or RQ. And uh, for the cluster number one, which is hosted by AWS and based on the C4 uh, compute instances, we would advise to use 18 cores, which would um, make sure that the hyper-threading is not affecting this calculation. And then I can select the notifications to be notified when the job is started, aborted, or ended. Okay, and uh, then I click on save job at the top to save this calculation. Uh, one important parameter here for the uh, compute uh, Compute setup is the time limit. By default, it's one hour. So what would happen is that uh, if the job runs over this limit, it will be administratively uh, deleted. So we need to make sure that um, we allocate enough time limit to finish the job first and to not to overspend on it as well. So we make it into a hard limit on purpose to avoid people overspending on these calculations. All right. So as we save the job, it is now available in uh, the corresponding list of jobs for the project. And it is initially in the pre-submitted status shown in this bright blue. We can now submit it by selecting uh, it in uh, the run option inside the dropdown for this job, which I am going to do right now. Uh, when we submit it, it changes the status uh, to submit it and becomes dark blue, as you can see. What happens next is that we provision the computational infrastructure from the cloud provider. So in this case, uh, we're running it on cluster 001. So we ask for a new uh, computational node to be added into our cluster specifically for this calculation. So um, the wait here is, is usually within 10 minutes or so. And as you can see, if I speed up the, the process here, indeed within two minutes, a new node is provisioned and added to the cluster and it is ready to run this calculation. When that happens, we, we see that the job goes into the active status shown in, in orange, and we can navigate and open this job and see its progress in real time. When we open the job, we can see now that uh, the first workflow 
of this job is active. And the first unit of this first sub workflow, excuse me, is active at present. When we click on the unit, we can now see the output, the standard output of this calculation that is posted to the web application in the real time. And we can see the convergence chart also posted to the web app in real time. Now, when this first unit is complete, it is turned green and the second unit is turned orange as it's uh, being active presently. So if we navigate and open that unit, we can trace and see uh, the progress of the calculation. Since this is a production type calculation, uh, it will take some time to complete, probably 15 minutes or so. Okay, if I speed up this video, we can see that uh, indeed completes uh, within six minutes. And at the end, both of these units are shown in green. All right. If we navigate back to the top of the page, we can see that in addition to the materials workflow and compute tabs in the top, we now have results in files. And if we navigate to the results tab, we can see that uh, our results like the uh, total energy, Fermi energy, pressure, uh, forces on the atoms that are extracted from the self-consistent field calculation and uh, non-self-consistent field calculation accordingly uh, at the bottom of this page. Now inside the files list, we can see the list of files that are produced during this calculation. And we can either download these files from the web into our local uh, computer, <coughs> or we can preview the files on the web. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's how we can access the data that is produced inside the calculation and it, we can see its results. In order to visualize the, uh, uh, the parameters that uh, this job was charged against, uh, we can take a look at the compute, no, the, uh, compute tab again and uh, see the cost of the job inside the compute form. Click on this uh, link to be able to view the corresponding cost. And runtime and all the, the uh, parameters associated with the account. Okay, now after we're done with this calculation, we have one optional step that we can take. And this step would be to share this job with another account. Um, to do that, we need to select this job in the list and select the share option. So here is where the collaboration can come in place. So I created this job under the webinar account, but now I would like to share it with my personal account. And to do that, I need to select my name here in the list of accounts and click the share, the read permission at the top. So my account will now have the read permission on this job. So we will be able to see this job, but I won't be able to delete it, for example. Um, that's the read permission in this case. Okay, as we can see here, uh, accordingly, we see that uh, the job is being publicly available and it's also being shared with another account. Okay, I will demonstrate how we can access the job from my personal account in a moment. All right, so let me summarize uh, the section about the uh, calculation jobs. Calculation jobs can be run either through the CLI or the user interface options. And we, when we use the command line interface, we, uh, it's a quick and familiar way for many, but <clears throat> it requires us to modify the input files each time the job is created and it is prone to error, this approach. And it's difficult to facilitate the sharing of the data. We have to do a lot of manual work, busy work to be able to uh, put all of this in place. Now, when we use the web interface, when we use the Exabyte platform, uh, we have to learn the approach first, but when we do that, there is less busy work. Um, there is a more streamlined way to uh, reuse materials for uh, the same workflow logic. And there is a streamlined way to collaborate and share these entities between multiple people, either within a single account or between multiple accounts in the platform and beyond. 
since most of the people use a limited number of workflows in their daily jobs, uh, maybe within a dozen or so, once we create those, uh, going through multiple different materials becomes easier and we don't have to work with uh, workflow logic too much. All right, um, now let's go and speak about the sharing and collaboration. First, we need to understand how we can access multiple accounts within the platform. Every user of the platform has a personal account associated with this user, just like um, if you're using Facebook, for example, or LinkedIn, you have your personal account associated with you, and then you can also be a member of a group. And this is a very similar concept where <clears throat> I am uh, having a personal account uh, for Timur, and I'm also a member of multiple other organizational accounts. So now I can demonstrate to you how we can use the platform as one of uh, these organizational accounts. I need to navigate to the My Accounts list by opening the right-hand sidebar, clicking on My Accounts, and then clicking on the Seminar in the list to be able to use the platform as the member of that account. Now, the entities that I'm going to see accordingly will change. So instead of seeing the projects that are created by my account, I will see the projects created by um, the seminar account and materials and workflows and jobs accordingly will change. Okay, so if I go to the bio, I can see the information about this account, not about myself. And accordingly, we come back to the my accounts list and go back, click on uh, my name here. We'll come back to my personal account. So that's an easy way to switch between uh, creating, modifying, editing the uh, entities for a particular account. Now, when we work with an organizational account, we have multiple members. And to be able to deal with the permissions that we allocate to those members, we have established a concept of teams. So first we can add a user to an organizational account. To do that, we can navigate to this account, people tab and uh, click on the plus button and select the corresponding username in the list. Well, or multiple. Here we have added people to the account. And the next step is to create a team for this organizational account. And a team can delegate a certain permission to the account, to this team members. So first we create the team and assign a certain set of permissions to it. Like in this case, it's gonna be a read permission. So this is a read-only uh, permission granting team. And then we can add the uh, uh, organization members to this team. In the equivalent way, we can select their usernames, and now this um, people are associated with the team that we have just created. The next step after that is to associate the entities with the team. So when I add a material to the team, what happens is that <clears throat> this material that by default is only accessible to the administrator, to the owner and administrators of the S organization. Now this material will become accessible read only to all the members of the team that I have just created. That is a way for us to delegate the permissions to assign a flexible role-based permission scheme to the entities and the account members. Now, beyond the permissions and working within a single organizational account, we also can have different access levels uh, per entities. So in this case, I will demonstrate it on uh, a set of four jobs. We can share a job with another account. Yeah, we can share a job with all other accounts in, uh, in the platform, meaning that any users that are logged in into our platform will be able to find and see uh, this entity. We can also share this entry with anyone that has a link to it. It's a very similar concept to uh, the one employed in Google Docs, for example. And we can also make this uh, 
entity accessible to anyone on the web. And they will be able to search for it using Google or any other search engines, and they will be able to find it uh, if, if they search for the right keywords. So these different access level scenarios are possible. And in order to enable those, again, we can select an entity here, click on the share tool in the top. And um, when I want to select and share this entity with a particular account, I can just select this account in the list and add a re-permission to it. When I want to share the entity with all accounts in the platform, I will have to select the public option here. And the public option really works in equivalent way to um, another account. It's just a system level account which grants permission to the public. Public consists of all the registered users in this case. All right. And equivalently, if I want to give access to anyone with the link, I select anyone with the link as an option. And if I want to give access to anyone on the web, I select the corresponding option here as well. All right. So now when we do share an associated difference, uh, different access levels with these entries, how do we find them in the platform? To do that, we need to open the left-hand sidebar and navigate to shared with me or shared publicly a list. And correspondingly, the shared with me list will contain the items that were shared with me directly. So there's a job that was shared with um, Timur directly earlier. And this, was, this job was produced uh, <clears throat> by Timur. Now it's shared with the webinar account. So that's how, uh, when I'm using the webinar account, I can find uh, this shared job. Here is another demonstration. We can select a job, click share, select a particular user that, or account that I want to share it with or, or multiple and give them read permission. Again, this is how it's going to look like, shared with me, uh, jobs tab, and you can see that uh, the original creator the seminar and the account that I'm accessing this job under now is to me. All right, this is how it looks like in the platform again. We navigate to share with me, we navigate to the jobs tab, and there's like that, that's where we can see the <clears throat> job entry. Now, when we navigate to the shared publicly page, we can see all the items that have been publicly shared within the platform. As we have, um, have several hundred users using the platform today, there's going to be multiple shared publicly entities available in this list, as you can see thousands of them. <clears throat> so when we navigate to the list of jobs, we can see uh, which jobs are being presently active. And uh, as of April of this year, you can see those the, here that was the list of jobs that people were working on uh, on April 16. And that is a convenient way to see um, activities of other people in the platform. And of course, <clears throat> of course, excuse me, there is a way to have, have um, a private access uh, to the platform where the data that is being generated by uh, the organizational accounts is uh, secluded and uh, only available to the people that are involved in this account, account members. Uh, by default, the data that is produced in the platform is public, especially for the free service level um, and so on. So privacy is a, a premium feature in the platform that is available for a certain set of service levels. Now, another feature that we have is the ability to add a description to the entity. So when we navigate to a, a job or a material or a workflow and click on this uh, information icon, we can associate a description with this entry. So we can communicate uh, and tell other people on our team, for example, specific information about this entry. So here, we support markdown language, so we can type 
excuse me, things like headers, and um, uh, we can put links and code base items into this description, as I'm demonstrating here. And when we exit um, the particular job, the job designer, the job viewer, and see this corresponding entry inside the list, we can enable the ID and description field, and this description will be shown inside the list. So when you edit the description, you can uh, then visualize it quickly in the list of the job. All right. Now, the last point that I wanted to mention here uh, when discussing the collaboration in a platform is related to how we uh, um, assert the uniqueness of these different items. And we do that by deploying an entity bank uh, concept. Entities are stored inside the entities collection per account. So each account, when we create them, contains a default material, which is exactly the same. So we have multiple copies of the same material, one per each account. Now, that would be a lot of um, inconvenience if we would always have to search through all uh, the equivalent entries. So to deal with that, we have introduced the entity bank collection that contains unique copies of the account collection materials and workflows. So unique copies are stored inside the materials bank and the workflows bank. And there is an algorithm which compares these entries automatically and then creates the bank entries accordingly. By default, um, the accounts that have private data enabled for them as a premium feature create entities that cannot be accessed by any other accounts inside the bank. So if I have created a new material, then no other accounts can access this material unless they have created an exactly the same material independently. And by default, we have the public data uh, enabled for the newly created accounts. And therefore, the data that they create is visible to other accounts uh, inside the materials bank and the workflows bank. Okay, so this is a way for us to track unique entities in the platform and um, introduce another way to share these entries uh, within the platform. All right, um, let me summarize here about the accounts and sharing uh, section of this presentation. Entities can be shared within a single account and only that account privately for a secure and safe collaboration. Account teams have different permission schemes and they allow these members uh, of the accounts to perform actions on the entities in a, in a different manner. Sharing between individual accounts is possible. It's possible to share an uh, entity with all the platform accounts at the same time or with the people outside our platform that are not yet registered. The entities that we support um, in the platform, they also uh, can be marked with metadata, such as tags or description. And that is a way that uh, we can communicate certain information, specific information to the entries in the database to other people on our team, for example, or to ourselves in the future. Um, unique entries are consolidated inside the entity banks, and they also have the private and public um, data access scenarios, depending on the service level for the account. Okay. I believe that's uh, all the content that I have for today. Let's see if you have any questions or anything that uh, you would like to discuss at this point. We have about five minutes, so let me know if um, you'd like me to go about to go through any of the uh, uh, topics that we just covered in more details. I'm looking at the Q and A session. There's nothing. I'm looking at the chat box. No questions yet. All right, if uh, no questions, then I'm going to wrap up um, 
this webinar session. If you do have any questions at any point in time in the future, please feel free to contact me either directly or you can contact some of the people on our team. Uh, you can access me directly either at timor at exabrite.io or you can access people on our team uh, sending an, uh, an email to info at exabrite.io. Uh, we usually are responding within uh, 24 hours or so and we'll be glad to hear your feedback and uh, I will see you in about uh, two weeks in the beginning of um, November and uh, we will be speaking about getting started with the expert platform during our regular schedule.